Again, thank you for the invitation, and I'll talk about lateral lumbar antibody fusion as a workhorse of MIS uh, constructs. Um, I just wanted to go back to some principles here. Uh, when we're talking about multi-level constructs and deformity, um, I'd like to start with the basics. So we know that L spinal deformity is a prevalent problem. Oops, sorry. How do I advance? The... There you go. Uh, we know it's a debilitating problem, uh, equivalent to diabetes and cancer. But the good news is that if the right patient is selected with the right plan and executed uh, uh, excellently, there is uh, great potential for improvement in these patients. How you pick the right plan, it depends on which philosophy you subscribe to. There's multiple different kind of classification systems. There's SRS Schwab, there's, um, sorry, I can't, there you go. Gap, there's uh, the newest one the from ISSG, the sagittal age-adjusted score that combines the SRS Schwab and Gap. And of course, Russo Lee, all of these are quantifications or descriptions of how to capture the original Dubois-Sase cone of economy. That your head should be above your shoulders, above your pelvis, uh, and all the way down. And you have to select the right patient. These surgeries are big operations, and there is a lot of blood loss, and it's equivalent to, excuse me, equivalent to uh, transplant surgery and cardiac bypass. So you have to optimize the modifiable risk factors in these patients, and you have to select the right patient and optimize them uh, before uh, pre-op. The divergence between open and MIS techniques doesn't happen in the plan, doesn't happen in the patient. It happens in the execution and the technique. And one of the things I'd like to emphasize uh, is that MIS deformity is not a shortcut of the principles, and the technique cannot be cannot supersede these principles. So what um, I'll show in a bit is how uh, pioneers in the field, not me, pioneers in the field were able to capture these principles and apply MIS techniques to um, address uh, these complex problems. Why do we have MIS techniques? Because open deformity surgery, as I showed you, has a high complication rate, uh, intra-op, post-op, and high revision rate. So the problem in hand was that we have a increasingly frail population that we do a small surgery on, I shouldn't say small, I should open surgery on, and if it doesn't, there you go, my video now should be working. Um, and if it doesn't work, you do a bigger operation on. And that doesn't add up. So the MIS is supposed to bridge that gap from an aging, frail population to where surgery could help uh, with the debilitating sy symptoms of deformity. So we can do something like this on the left as opposed to something on the right. The difference, like I said, is in the technique. The workhorse of an open is posterior. Uh, just about everything comes from posterior. The shortening of the column where your correction comes from, orthodesis and directed compression versus lateral where the majority of work comes from lengthening of the spine through the disc space. The workhorse is, is lateral, uh, essentially from anywhere above the uh, L5-S1 disc and L5-S1 disc, obviously a lift remains the favor uh, favorable approach. An MIS T lift can always be used as a backup option if lateral doesn't work. I'll get into these differences in uh, techniques in a little bit. This year, I was uh, I had the I had the opportunity and the privilege to work with the MIS arm of the ISSG to summarize the works group and how they were able to use the principles that have been established in open deformity surgery and apply the MIS techniques to achieve similar results in carefully selected patients. And in this paper, we talk about these different algorithms and kind of uh, way of thinking, and I'll get into some cases. Uh, I was hoping to be there in person so we can have an interactive session, uh, hopefully with the attendees, but I'll just go through the cases uh, myself. But we talk in this paper first by discussing who who is the right patient for MIS. And MISTF2 is the latest uh, algorithm for 
selecting this patients that was evolved from MIST F1. Uh, the main difference from MIST F1 to 2 is essentially uh, captured by the fact that there are there's evolution of um, MIS techniques, mainly uh, ACR and also mini open PSO. We'll focus on ACR here. But essentially, the more complex the deformity is, the less lucky that you can um, correct it with MIS techniques only. So class one would be purely MIS, and this gets more complicated towards class four, where it can only be done through an open technique. The surgical planning requires you to understand what your tools are. Um, NACR is a very powerful tool um, that it can be combined with posterior osteotomies to give you corrections that are similar to PSOs. Um, and, um, um, you know, starts with grade one, where you essentially do a lateral and you release the anterior longitudinal ligament. This can be combined with uh, posterior column osteotomies from um, the original SRS Schwab classification uh, uh, sorry, the Schwab classification for uh, osteotomies to give you larger and larger corrections. This is where it, we can capture the, the reason that why lateral is the workhorse. As you can see, there's a lot of green line that goes towards the lateral and ACR, which is basically a modification of lateral. And TLIF is used when uh, lateral really doesn't work and it's very... Um, finite number of situations that where you can't really use lateral. Uh, here we're talking about a lateral trans psoas and Dr. Anand will speak about the uh, lateral anti psoas technique, uh, but there's very few situations where you can't use lateral to uh, correct deformities through MIS technique. And of course, L5S1 remains the outlier here. You just don't have access to it through a uh, lateral trans psoas position. This is a uh, work where Dr. Anand and the rest of the ISSG group where um, it essentially gives you a checklist of things to look for. I actually have a slide that we can make it bigger. And in the next few slides, I'll be able to hopefully go through some, some of these cases to explain what you should uh, look. But uh, the checklist has one through four grading system and essentially one is more novice uh, uh, surgeon, and number four is more experienced sur surgeons like Dr. Anon himself, where you can use MIS techniques alone, circumferentially, no need for osteotomy, that you can correct uh, larger and larger deformities. So you have to have an eye for MIS as you're working up this patient. I don't consider myself a purely MIS surgeon. I think uh, the modern spine surgeon should be able to use MIS techniques and open techniques in appropriately selected patients. I do have a uh, predilection to select uh, or, or look for opportunities to do these things through MIS. So when I work up a patient, I look to see if can, I can find uh, appropriately uh, appropriate candidate for MIS correction of the deformity. So you want to measure your global alignment, spinal pelvic parameters. That stays true for any patient. One of the important things is assessing the flexibility and getting long cassette x-rays both in standing and supine. If you don't have uh, supine x-rays, you can look for opportunities to substitute it. This is a patient that uh, has a degenerative scoliosis coronal shift towards the concavity of the curve. I don't have a long cassette x-rays, but on the scout view of the uh, MRI, I can see on the right that uh, the curve is essentially corrected just by the patient laying supine. So that gives you an opportunity to the, through the disc spaces alone, through the lateral transoas, I can get my correction and with percutaneous fixation, hold the patient in place. Con uh, shift towards the concavity also very important. If towards the convexity as uh, the checklist, uh, the checklist I was showing is significantly harder to correct those as you put in each uh, lateral in a body, you shift the curve more and more towards the convexity. Um, this is an opportunity for uh, lateral MIS. You wanna look at the uh, psoas anatomy and where the uh, compression comes from. When you have a true disc herniation, 
you cannot correct these through uh, indirect decompression. If the psoas is transposed anteriorly, you could still do a trans psoas, but it's exceedingly harder and your window of opportunity to not over um, stretch the plexus is much shorter. Um, but again, experts, Dr. Isak, Dr. Ribe, look for the psoas and pull the psoas back. Uh, for me, this is something that uh, is not safe in my hand at this point, and I try not to uh, pose uh, additional risk of lumbar plexus injury in these patients. Look at the CT. Any opportunity for correction through the disc space will manifest itself as air in the disc space. They will respond very favorably to uh, distraction across the disc space, um, uh, where your correction in the sagittal and coronal plane will come from. If you have uh, f um, fused facets, you might want to release them with uh, dropping a tube in uh, to maximize your corrective potential. Let's talk about some cases, and I was, uh, again, hoping to make this interactive, but I'll just uh, talk through them. Let me see if I can move this. Excuse me. So this is a... Uh, this is a patient uh, in her 70s with uh, mostly uh, back pain and some leg pain and wants to be able to walk on um, tours uh, on vacation. So relatively low PI. It's, uh, PI elements mesh is almost uh, 20 degrees. We look at the MRI here. First thing I notice here is that L5S1 disc is almost intact. Uh, you know, it, it remains, the disc height is maintained. There is, uh, is well hydrated with increased uh, signal intensity compared to every level above it. If I don't have to go to the S1 and spare the patient the uh, fusion to lumbosacral junction and uh, extension of the pelvis, I would take that opportunity anytime I can. At L4-5 on the axial, you can see there is a uh, huge facet of fusion. That is a... Um, opportunity for correction with no need for osteotomies. And you can see some um, uh, spinal ascesis L4-5 as well. On the CT, you start to see some uh, air in the disc space at L3-4. Again, redemonstrations of L4-5 spondy and uh, the slight segmental coronal deformity at each of these uh, levels. Oops, sorry. Let's see if I can play this video. No need for osteotomies, just placement of the lateral lumbar antibody devices. Distraction across the disc space is all you need where you can get your correction in lordosis, where the PILL, uh, sorry, where the uh, lumbar lordosis did not match the uh, pelvic incidence. And you can see that, that level that was essentially totally flat at L34 now is about uh, 15 degrees of lordosis, no need for osteotomies, no need to extend to the pelvis. Uh, this shows the huge Mahan. power of apples where side, you can convex side. correct the segmental deformity of the, uh, sorry, segmental coronal uh, deformity uh, just by going through the osteophytes laterally and lifting up the Nima? disc veins. Nima? Yeah. Oh, uh, we had a question here from Mohammed. Oh, yeah, of course, yeah. Did you go in from the concave side or the convex side? I go from the concave side. Almost almost always I go from the concave side. Makes this incision smaller. The only time I would consider a convexity is if the psoas anatomy is somewhat unfavorable on the concavity. And so, you did it prone or lateral? Lateral. Prone, I, I don't feel comfortable doing multi-level prones. Uh, especially when it involves L4-5 yet. Um, for me, the learning curve is do as many L3-4, maybe L2-3s as I can um, before I can transition to adopting it in L4-5. Um, well, I, don't, I don't think Neil's here, but, you know, uh, Neil, we, oh, no, I mean an audience right now. Oh, okay. I, I missed you back there. I know you moved. But uh, you could weigh in on that. But, you know, whether it's concave or convex, uh, the approach side, I, I think, you know, there, there's pros and cons. So if, if it's a, you know, these are pretty mild curves, but if you have a more uh, moderate to severe curve, 
if you come on a concave side, the, the nice aspect is that it curves toward posteriorly and it's a shorter distance. It's easier to access the disk space and level it, whereas on a concave side, I agree, it, uh, it's one, one incision because everything comes to a point, but it's usually a longer distance this, yeah. and it rotates away from you, so you're more anterior on your approach. And also entering a disk space, if it's really collapsed, you know, it's like a severe deformity, you have more chance of violating the end play. I mean, there's pros and cons to e either approach. Uh, but I, you know, just uh, in, in some surgeons just do concave, concave. But I, I, I think there's pros and cons. I think that's one of the factors for that problem. Hmm. I, I'm not dogmatic about it, uh, Dr. Park. Uh, convex, concave. My preference is concave, and and all those things that you mentioned, I do consider um, uh, in terms of selecting your approach. So, and there is a paper, I believe. Uh, 2017-18 where there was a comparison of convex to con concavity to convexity and it seems to be equivalent but again those are experienced surgeons like yourself yeah. dr Cantor, that you really good. taylor here but that's one of the advantages of prone laterals that i can actually mark out both sides and so if there's a problem going from one side i can always switch to the other side i found that You're like bilateral. yeah <laughs> hey hey Neem, let me use yes. this one Hey, Nima, this is Paul. Uh, can you put your AP Scoli x-ray back up? Yeah, thanks. Um, one of the lessons, you know, some people that do deformity are kind of like in the lanky school, so it's all posterior, maybe a T-lift at one or two levels at the bottom. And then you've got people that train back in the day that do like anterior column support, so they'll do like an L3 to S1 A-lift. Um, uh, I think one of the harsh lessons that we kind of learned with some of the MIS stuff is that when you um, correct your fractional, if you correct the main curve, right, you throw them out of, uh, out of balance. And um, if, you, um, if you need to, if the left side of the L4-5 disc, if that's collapsed on the right side, meaning that you need to theoretically distract more on the right side, if you do 4-5 from an ALIF approach, usually the vascular anatomy is going to push you unless you really have slack vessels and a great exposure surgeon. Your grafts are going to be more on the left side. And I've seen a couple cases where someone did both four five and five one from the front, and they actually made the fractional curve worse because the graph wound up on the left hand side. So, I mean, I think doing four five and five one both from an ALIF approach is a good is a good option when you want to distract on the left side. And then to Paul's point, if you do four five and five one from an ALIF approach, that then opens up the opportunity. Like if you have massive lateral osteophytes on the concavity, if you do four five from the front then you can potentially do two, three, and three, four from the convexity. It makes that a little bit easier. But that, that's one thing that I think is an important point for people that are kind of like, okay, I'm going to do, you know, a three-level lateral. And if you, um, you know, if you throw the, if you don't fix the fractional curve, it's a big problem. Uh, especially true, Dr. Holman, if it's, uh, the shift is towards the convexity of the curve. Um, this I wanted to show uh, the, the power of indirect decompression ligament ataxis. Uh, no direct decompressions, and you can see even the ligamentum flavum buckling is uh, improved by uh, distraction across the disc space. Uh, this patient, okay, so I did. We did not want to go to L five S one because the five one was preserved. Going to five one would have required probably extension to the pelvis. Um, uh, and this is the um, post-op images. I think I'm, uh, Linda told me I have to till 12.05. I'll go through one more case. I have three cases total. This is a little bit of an unusual uh, situation, uh, uh, presentation here. This is a 50% back pain, 50% leg pain. But if you look at the numbers that he's presenting with, it's not a high PI patient, 41 degrees, uh, with a really high SVA, 112. Um, CSVL is, you know, six millimeters, not really imbalanced, um, relatively flat, uh, 
L4 to S1 compared to the entire lumbar lordosis. You want the most of your lumbar lordosis to be at the bottom. But what's, what was interesting to me was that despite the fact that he had such a high SVA, the pelvic tilt was essentially normal. Um, so he was, he almost had the appearance like as if he had camptochormia. So I, when I have patients that have, their, their numbers don't add up, I always look for reasons outside of the spine that is driving their uh, quote unquote deformity. So this patient had a relatively extensive workup. Uh, I sent a neurology to make sure there's no Parkinson's, there's no neuromuscular uh, disease of some sort. And um, all of that came back negative. We did radiofrequency ablations, excuse me, uh, at multiple levels. And uh, he had a temporary improvement. Um, I wanted to also highlight the importance of having an eye for MIS surgery. You want to know relevant abdominal surgery, especially the cholecystectomy laparoscopically. It's not a contraindication for lateral. If there's a concern, the two incision uh, technique also helps, which uh, Dr. Pimenta is a big fan of. Um, trying to make this go a bit faster. So on the MRI, you can see the first disc that's healthy is the L12. It's this one. And you can see the frame is open and every other level is involved to the S1. Uh, L2, 3, 3, 4, 4, 5, and 5, 1. <clears throat> Air in the disc space, very important. And you can also see the, the, the slight fractional curve that Dr. Hallman was mentioning. Uh, this is, I think, probably a, an example of what you were saying, uh, Dr. Hallman. Um, so my plan for this gentleman was to do L4 to S1 A lift, uh, two to four laterals, uh, with the intention to give the give him indirectly compression and not cause too much lordosis in the proximal lumbar spine and then fix it posteriorly. Two stage surgery. Um, the reason for two stages, I I don't have the eye for kind of predicting what it looks like after putting all these laterals in one setting. That oppor that gives me an opportunity to, uh, you know, again, I'm not dogmatic. If my laterals don't give me the response I wanted, I could always go back in in the second stage to do uh, uh, PCOs if I need to. But uh, this is the correction I was looking for. And you can see the fractional curve is corrected uh, uh, with ALIF, um, pre-op, post-op from stage uh to stage one. Now he can stand straight. Rare, but one of those patients that immediately after surgery is like, I can stand up on that pain that I had going down my left leg is improved. I think it's from indirect compression down on L4, 5 to 5, 1. And uh, posterior fixation with percutaneous uh, screws L2 to S1. Same pelvic tilt, lumbar lordosis is improved. Most of it is now at the bottom. Uh, and he can uh, stand up more straight. So this is the uh, correction, both coronal plane and sagittal plane uh, through many lateral. Also notice uh, the advantage of getting these EOS images. You can see that even knee flexion is improved uh, from pre to post -op. I don't know if I have time for another case, Dr. Park, or? Um, I, uh, Nima, we're a bit over, unfortunately. Okay. So, uh, it was uh, a great presentation. If you want to advance the conclusion, I I will, I will just make it really quick, this one. So this is this is a fixed deformity. L5S1 needs to have a PSO at the bottom, but there's also opportunity to vacuum phenomenon high up. This is where you can combine a PSO at the bottom with an ACR above to create a harmonious correction in your lordosis. That's the ACR. There you go. So you can build the lordosis down at the bottom, but also... Uh, Take advantage of this vacuum phenomenon. I would not do ACR alone here. This would uh, be a recipe for PJK if you don't correct it at the bottom. And this is what it looks like after. Quick conclusion. If you select the right patient, uh, plan the surgery carefully, and execute it expertly, you will have success with multi-level lateral MIS constructs. Thank you so much, Dr. Park, for the invitation. I'd be happy to answer any further questions. Thank you. Any, any questions?